So I've asked Emily, who actually is the big caretaker for all of these aroids, which is a tall task, and I figured I'd have you select, maybe they're not your favorites, because it's important not to say favorites in front of all of these plants, but some of the ones that you could select, and we could learn from that as well, because there's a lot of new species that I had never heard of, and I'm sure you're gonna select a few that are new to other folks as well. So what would be your first one that you would highlight? Well, okay, maybe I should go back and get the one that was named after me. This episode is brought to you by Brightland. All right, so I'm gonna be making one of my favorite dishes today. Actually, it's pretty much one of my favorite dishes for more cold season weather. So I have this ugly guy. This is a celeriac root or celery root. I have parsnips, carrots, Jerusalem artichokes. Those are pretty funky. Onion and garlic. And then I'm going to be using some of this full-bodied Brightland olive oil. Oh, it's just divine. This is the garlic one. That will be like the foundation of this. So this is female owned. They source from family farms in California and it has the most buttery, robust, full-bodied flavor. And you can see the bottles are super beautiful. So they have artists that actually do all the artwork on their bottles. And I also appreciate the little touches like the harvest date so you can actually see when the olives were harvested. And there's no additives in this and it's produced by organic methods. So you're really feeding your body with delicious stuff. So that's gonna be the foundation of this. And I'm gonna basically let the onions simmer in that full body buttery goodness. So you can get 10% off of Brightland's premium products by clicking on the link in the description below. All right. So we have several specimens of this one and it's uh, Coletiatum, which is, Coletti is my last name. Tom collected it in Ecuador in Morona, Santiago in 2002, which just happens to be the year I came back to the garden after an 18 year pause. <laughs> and it's actually kind of a fading bloom, but it's actually also has an inflorescence on it. So it was collected in 2002, but then he named it in 2008. Uh, actually, I think that uh, was the year that he collected as 100,000th. Oh, wow. Possibly. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. But anyway, so this is a porph porphy, uh, one of the 20 or so uh, sections of Anthurium. And uh, it's a privilege to have a plant named after you, knowing that the appreciation that Tom has for the work I do here in the Yeah, greenhouse. and Tom had mentioned he just doesn't name them after anybody, but he names them at after you know, folks who've had a real role to play in this. So yeah, that is an honor. So anyway, so this is it. Like I said, it's not my favorite, but it's it's noteworthy for sure. It's sorry, but as my children would say, mom, shh, don't doubt they'll hear you say those bad things. So, <laughs> And Ecuador is one of those places that Tom has collected a lot of uh, plant material. It's very rich in in uh, the aeroids. So I try to have in the collection two to three specimens of mm -hmm. each. Things that are on the rarer side, and it's the only actually accession number, our collection number that we have in that particular um, specimen. Great. And it's the type specimen, so. Yeah. All right, so this is Amorphophallus bulbifer. bulbifer. Okay, so, and then I. Oh, I'm, that's cool how it I'm looks. sure like it little... gets its names from the little bulblets. Yeah. And like I said, they just kind of, I'm just seeing if that ripe enough yet. They pop off. Let's see. Not quite. When ripe. they're real ripe, they pop off real easy. And so they actually just look like a little callus. Do they just do they uh, shoot off or do they just fall off? 
Well, you know, all Amorphophallus go dormant, mm -hmm. so this will turn yellow, then brown, and mm -hmm. it'll, it'll fade away, and then this little callus will just drop down into the soil where it is. Now, the ones that are up in the climatron, you, you can actually kind of see where, where they've kind of reproduced. So you, ha you, can, you see them reproduce this way, and then notice this big cluster, oh, our yeah. colony of baby Amorphophallus uh, bulbifers, mm -hmm. which are from all the seeds that happen to fall down from here. So you have the seedlings, and then you have the calluses, and then uh, I've never done a leaf cutting with them, but you don't really need to because they were <laughs> very prolific just and in that, those ways. Is that how most people would propagate a plant? Right. Not, not all of them produce bulblets. Most of them are, they, they you come from seed, or yeah. what happens too is, um, especially with this, this species back here, it actually tends to, the, the tubers themselves just divide and, and, and get, and actually the whole pot will be filled with tubers and there's no soil in there and you're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> I wonder if this one has um, more geographic restrictions or something in its ecosystem that has encouraged it to propagate so many different types of ways, you know what I mean? Right, and... and um, like seeds, um, versus, bulbet, yeah, bulbets, yeah. like, you know, all that type of thing. Now, you said you take leaf cuttings off of this. How would you take a leaf cutting? Is it just part of the leaflet, or...? Well, what, well especially with the Titan, mm -hmm. again, you can produce them from seeds, but it's not always easy to get the, the pollen mm -hmm. from another institution or far to even... The ability for some of these plants to, to be pollinated mm -hmm. is mind-blowing, especially with, with the Titan because of the timing that has to go go into it because many of them, the female flowers are receptive prior to the male flowers, you know, releasing their pollen. Right. So they don't self-pollinate. So if you have this huge plant that there might not be another bloom half a mile away, how the, the probability of it, of it propagating itself by even seeds is, yeah. is just like, Wow, because it <laughs> only has a, like a 12-hour window of opportunity to be pollinated. Right. But so we did discover that if you just take a piece of the leaf, probably about like this. Wow. And here you can see another little bulb, bulb there, and you just kind of you can stick this piece here down in. Uh, uh, take a little bit of the and stick it down in root hormone. Yeah. Put it down in some perlite and it will grow a little tubule. Oh my gosh, who would have thought? And then do you ever like um, cut off the tops of the leaves just so it's for oh, sure. you, transpiration? You, yeah, and yeah, and, and a lot of times too, um, I've, I've found that just to increase the, the humidity mm -hmm. is just to either put a, a dome over it yeah. or stick it like I have, um, when I repot my dormant titans, especially the small ones, I put them in wet perlite and then cover them with a Ziploc. Yeah. So it keeps it very humid, it keeps it moist, and it leaves the wet wet off of it, but it stays moist enough. And it seems to um, create an environment where the dormancy doesn't last as long as it would have that I've, in, with, you know, just waiting it on a bench in the basement. Yeah. So just to recap, this one, um, you, could, you could take a leaf propagation or cutting it could actually divide itself when the bulb gets big enough and then you have some, you know, ex like extra bulbs on the bottom. It has the bulbets uh, and then it seeds. It could actually also seed. And it readily, and it read readily seeds, so it must, it must pollinate itself. Yeah. So the seeds will come out of the flower that it produces or will they well, come out of this thing? Oh no! It would be out of the flower. This is yeah. just this is just an, another. That's like another safeguard. Another, another way. safeguard with yeah. it. So I don't. It, it's amazing how how these have developed do, over the years to do, do that. Do any other plants have this? Well, yeah, like lilies and stuff. Sometimes we'll get the little bulb bulbet bulbets on it and stuff now, like that. Now the fun thing is with um, with the ZZ plant. Mm -hmm. I had that was another one do, I was going to show well, let's, you. Let's highlight that I because. Love that. Okay, so here's your ZZ. You're, you, there, the flowers aren't that magnificent, and I couldn't find any on there. Yeah. 
while I was looking at it. They're pretty inconspicuous. But I was coming down here and cleaning up earlier, and lo and behold, oh. the azizi plants really will propagate quite easily. Yeah. They'll just drop their debris, the leaf debris, and um, produces a little tuber on the end. Then you can just put that in this, you know, pot it up in a, in a mix and. That's a root. Yeah, these are the roots here, and then this is just a little tuber. So it grew the tuber from the leaf. Uh huh. It's, and it, all it did was fall into the to the gravel down here. Wow. So um, these leaves aren't so uh, so lucky. No, those aren't so lucky. And then it doesn't it, work on concrete. Yeah. Right? Well, not. I mean, I'm surprised it doesn't. But <laughs> then um, I'm trying to see. I saw. Oh, that was the gonadopus I was going to show you. Sometimes you can have. You know, some of the plants will take over. Our, our, um, yeah, so that's that's fun. And yeah. that's pretty much what, what the uh, titans and some of the other amorphophallus do when you do the leaf propagations. Well, I, I'm looking at the ZZ, and it's um, we had repotted one that seemed very, uh, you know, uh, contained, but this one is like popping out of its container. Is this something that you would just keep on letting go because it seems to have grown really well and restricted. I now terracotta. I have found myself now there will be others that disagree yeah. with me, but in general I have found that the Eraceae tend to like to be pot bound. Yeah. And I don't like to disturb a sleeping baby. <laughs> <laughs> It's just fine. Yeah. It's growing. It's got beautiful coloration. Yeah. There's no reason for me, unless you start, you know, getting yellow leaves mm -hmm. and it, it looks really unhappy, mm -hmm. there's no reason for me, especially in this. Yeah. I don't need it to get bigger. I just need it to... Uh, exists. Yeah. I mean, although this is a lovely, lovely sp um, specimen it, here. It absolutely is. But I do love how, you know, you have things happen. And because I'm not able to get to everything as quickly as some other places might, you get to find the real fun things that happen in, in nature as in here because it will drop into those. And we have the gravel underneath for to help with the humidity. So um, a lot of, we do have a lot of concrete, but we also have under the benches and this greenhouse anyway, yeah. the gravel. And I mean, you, you already showed us like how amazing, like that you've actually planted under the bench purposely as well, because some, some plants actually like it under there. Right. And that ZZ probably didn't mind that he got some like fertile, fertile ground to propagate in. So uh, that's fun, and then and then there's a plant on the bench back here, also the gonadopus. What do you think about the black ZZ plant? Because I, I noticed you had a couple in here. I have one for yeah. sure. Um, that actually came from one of my uh, my cohorts here yeah. in the building. Um, oh, the gonadopus yeah. right here. That's a kind of cool name, gonadopus. And um, I think they have some in the climatron, but it's just kind of a fun plant because it has giraffe knees. That's what I call these on. I think you know, that's... I actually noticed that the ZZ plant has giraffe knees too. Sorry to go back to the ZZ, but strangely enough, I have to show you this story because I wonder if you ever experienced it with the ZZ, especially because all the plants are here. I noticed ZZs have these too. And I was walking and I snapped a branch. And the next day later, the entire branch was over here like away from the light and away from where it got yeah, snapped. It it, uh, it helps, it's like the, on the anthurium. Yeah. It helps it so that it kind of, it's like an elbow. Yeah. It gives it the ability to, for the leaf to to bend up and go easier than than normal. Cause some of these are pretty, um, you know, so it, it can it can go towards the light. Yeah. And so, but these guys, what is interesting about these is it also does this, as you can see down here. Oh yeah. They'll they'll um, come up, and there's there's some over here, and these leaves will fall into other pots, and actually take over the pot, like this one back here, 
the uh, so the leaflet or the full leaf? Well, the le a leaflet, all a leaf, all, only a leaflet has to fall. Only the leaflet. Wow. Only a leaflet has to fall, yeah. and it will go down in the and I'll just lay as litter in the pot. Yeah. And then the tubers of themselves are white. They're beautiful, um, and they get rather big. And I'll, as you can see, they'll break open pots too. Yeah. And. Um, this pot back here has its original plant in it, a Dracunculus, but... So which one is the original? The original is dormant. Oh, it's dormant. So the original is dormant, and, and it, uh, but uh, this is what has taken over most of the pot. So it, it does come up, and I need to repot it and take, take it out, but I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. So, I mean, these are just kind of fun, and you yeah. don't see these a lot, and it's got kind of a fun name. It, it's got a really, it seems like a Dr. Seuss, like an octopus with something like a <laughs> giraffe, like. Right. But, so, but I, I do wonder about these little knobby knees, because I'm the thing that was striking to me about the ZZ, and I'm sure it probably happens with this one, is that it sensed danger. It was It's not like it moved towards the light. It sensed danger oh, because okay. it got cut and it literally moved to the opposite end of where it got hit, hit and broken. Okay, so I'll I was to like, notice that. Wow, that is just like so neat. So if you ever accidentally break one, I'd be curious. As I to might which... even do it on purpose oh, just no, to see. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. Um, but then I also noticed your little black ZZ back there too. You have one right here. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the smart weed gets everywhere. Oh yeah. Um, haven't been to any botanical garden that has, doesn't ha it doesn't have it. What kind of weed is that? It's called smart weed. Where's Does it get of? a little pink flower on it, or white flower? A little white flower. Yeah. Oh. It's related to the pink one that you saw in our land. And it it just um, like I said, I've never seen a botanical garden that hasn't <laughs> had it. Well, this one's a new one for me. That's that's marvelous. Yeah. So I mean. They just see this one. Well, I just broke it off. <laughs> I mean, that was just came up from the debris. Yeah, but you could actually propagate each one of these leaflets. Mm -hmm. And they'll do the same type of thing. Yeah. And that's pretty much the color of the, the tuber under, yeah. under here. So that, that, those are just fun things that I've noticed yeah. over the years that just kind of happen. Um, just because a lot of things happen when you're not looking. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Just like that's easy. What's interesting about this plant is they don't, they seem to get, and I don't know if this is true, but just from my observation. I mean, look at the, the bulbs on this. Right here. Right. And I'm terrible about pronouncing making proper Enunciations of things, so I always hate to to, to hate to mess That's them okay. up. That's okay. I always tell people just pronounce it how you think it would because it's like speaking another language. You're never going to learn unless you do it. Amorphophallus coatinius. They used to be glossifolius. Okay. And then they changed to that, and I don't know why the uh, the tags aren't always correct in the... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm also assuming if it constantly changes, you have to constantly move. Right, it. but what happens with these is they also will get those Little those bulbets, bulbets on yeah. them, but it seems to happen like every other year okay. as opposed to yearly. And I I, I, I threw some in, in um, the prop house just to make, see if they'd they mm. propagate because I wasn't sure about yeah. them. I knew the bulb, bulb um, the bulbifers would because I've... I propagated them before. Yeah. But yet, lo and behold, they're very, you know, and, and these, and these, this, this pot. If I if I broke open this pot, all yeah. that would be left in here was not nothing but just massive tuber, one right. after another. Right. Right. There'd probably be 50 of them in there. How do these eat as far as fertilizer goes? Because I'd imagine these are hungry compared to even some of your other plants. Um, just in general here, I just pretty much it's just a low dose fertilizer all the time, okay. you know, 100 parts per minute, 
million. Okay. Most of the time it's on. Every so often we run out, so mm -hmm. they luckily their soil gets flushed out. Yeah. But since our pH is so high, I, I just like to continue to use it, and even the in the winter time. When you're saying the pH is high, it's sometimes when the pH is high, it doesn't um, release a lot of the nutrients for the plant, right? When right. you have your pH. Right. It, are, are the plant is incapable of, of absorbing taking it up? Yeah. Taking it up. So, um, our, you know, the pH will just tie it up mm -hmm. itself. And so by using the fertilizer that we use, we use 15, 5, 15 cow mag mix. Mm -hmm. It's a Peter's mix. And um, it does marvelous. I love this one behind you. I know I'm, this might not be one of your selections, but the, the little pink edging. Oh yeah, I there's a couple of them that have the pink edging, and I have so many tags in these because I, I keep keep track of when they bloom and yeah. all of that kind of stuff on those tags. But this one is, is the Henry Eye. This is a pretty common one, and it's one that again the tubers will divide and divide and mm -hmm. divide, and it's one of and it has a very short uh, peduncle, mm -hmm. and uh, it smells very badly. <laughs> It's very similar in smell and look, just like the konjac is, yeah. to the Amorphophallus titanium. They have the same coloration, same awful smell. Yeah. Um, the Henry eye is much shorter. It mm -hmm. doesn't. The peduncle is very short, but with the konjac, the, the peduncle gets to be about as tall as us. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing about about them is the smell lasts for a couple of days. Okay as opposed to just the this, this short amount of time. So, and then you usually smell it at certain times of the day. So many times the, the security will come in here at night uh, and they're just like, why did you do this to us? <laughs> so nighttime is a time when they seem to smell the worst. Yeah. If you come in earlier in the morning, you can just start walking down the corridor mm -hmm. and it kind of hits you in the face as to the smell. So it, you know, it's gonna smell the time of day that the pollinators are the most active. And so, and when they're receptive, or when they release their pollen, mm -hmm. or when they're receptive, so. And how would you describe it? Is it like a, like a roadkill kind of smell, or? Yeah, rotted, yeah. rotted roadkill. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. been there a couple days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I've, you know, in here, we've, we, we've kept, caught mice, and a mouse has been left in the trap way too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our you know, really, hot day trash can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So a lot of gardens will take this illustration or some of the, oh, well, we have mm -hmm. uh, front and back. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll take this illustration, which came from Wisconsin. And so they, they've done this, this one, which is a really good representation of the bloom itself. Yeah. And the thing that happened with us here and, and I'd love to hear from anybody out there that has a differing view about titans when they're blooming, is that um, as they go from, well, you either get the leaf or you get the bloom. And again, right. once they hit about 10 years old, we've had one at like nine, we've had one 20 that, you know, years old before they bloom. So it's kind of relative, but once they do bloom, they tend to re-bloom mm -hmm. uh, over and over and again. And can you tell, it looks like it says bud develops into flower or a new leaf. Can you really tell when it's developing, whether it's gonna be a bud or a leaf? Those of us that have been doing it a while, we can tell. I've okay. been pretty much, because there's a, several sites on Facebook yeah. that actually there's a group and they'll go, okay, is this a bloom or a leaf? Yeah. And everybody will, you know, and they'll go, they'll tell it. Yeah. It, you know, there's there's a bit of a difference that you can you can see, mm -hmm. but to the untrained eye, mm -hmm. maybe not. But once it, this is the point here, mm -hmm. and if you come here, mm -hmm. this is the point here where it reveals itself or reveals the bud. And um, at that point there, is where a lot of us start counting the days. Mm -hmm. And so from this point to this point isn't as important in timing mm -hmm. as from this point to this point. Right. So when it actually breaks through the bracts here and then, um, you know, it develops and then it starts losing the 
the bracks start mm -hmm. falling down. That's, those are all signs that things are getting closer and closer. Well, we got to this point here where the bracks had fallen and I put up our grow stick behind me from this one. If you can notice, we yeah. got to 102 oh, inches yeah. this time. <laughs> so it was over eight foot tall. This line down here is actually was the soil line. So that's actually, uh, it starts here and not, you know, all the way from the floor. So that's where it's the, like an overgrown child. <laughs> right. So, but I mean, each one of these, so this is the day, this 37 is where, when it revealed itself. Right. And so you could see each, each morning we would come in and, 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 and um, measure. Yeah. And you could see just how much it's grown much it grows in just one in, evening. In yeah. one evening. And most yeah. of them grow a little bit during the day, but most of the growth is at night. Yeah. So the interesting part of it was it got to that part where the bracts had fallen. And mm -hmm. usually it's, they say it's within one or two days that it's going to bloom. We're on day four, and it's not opening. And our 10th our bloom didn't open at all. Oh, so it had boarded. And so that, you know, so I was, I'm like, it's the same tuber, but it bloomed the first time that it, 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 it you know, sent up an yeah. inflorescence. So it got to the point at like 98, 99 inches where it was still growing. Well, when you start slowing down in growth, that's also another sign that your bloom is about ready to open. Yeah. Well, it just stayed there. So I'm panicking. I'm like, oh, we can't have this happen again. I know it's not, oh, just there's not enough energy. I just, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I'm like, start calling people and emailing people. And luckily I talked um, to Brandon at the Huntington mm -hmm. and he's like, Emily, my first question before I ask, before anything else, before you say a word, do you have a light? on the webcam, yeah. on the plant. And I said, yes, I do. He goes, go turn it off. Oh. Within 36 hours, it should have bloomed probably on Saturday with all of the indications. Yeah. We turned off that light, said, put a note on Facebook and said, sorry, we're letting, we're letting Octavia rest tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no light. So Tuesday night, Wednesday night, sometime between 9 o'clock and 5.45 in the morning, it started to open. We didn't have a total open. We only had a partial open. Mm -hmm. But Brandon and I are convinced that putting lights on the webcam are a no-no. It just needs that ability needs that to dark. be able to, the, to darkness. Maybe it's like a photo period or something along those right. lines. Right, and, and the, fun, the interesting thing is, and please, Please, anybody that, that has any information, let Brandon or I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, because he quit, he turns his lights off by 10 o'clock. And he goes, nobody really needs to look at it in the middle of the night. It right. should bloom between 3 and 4 in the afternoon. OK. I, I look at all of the different ones that in the news, and I try to find out what time they open. And, and now I'm trying to contact them trying to find out if they had lights on them or not. Yeah. But like, uh, I think there was Roddy Top who started to bloom at uh, like six in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we had another one in uh, Washington DC that started to bloom at one o'clock in the morning. I'd imagine you'd have some kind of a morphophallus slack group or something that you're all Well, like, I <laughs> would love, I would love for that to be. Yeah. There's some of us trying to, it's just that you're most excited about it, yeah. when, it when you're in the bloom. Yeah. And then everybody kind of has, you know, everything else to do. Yeah. Um, but uh, Brandon Tam, like he said, he goes, there, if it's it going to produce a plant, a flower that's going to get that big mm -hmm. and look like this. Yeah. Then it's going. It's got enough energy to open. There's Absolutely. something. Something else that's environmental that's that's breaking them up. Right. So, but just disrupting. I think that night cycle has something to do with it not liking, or it will it won't open at the right time. Like, it's not too typical. Why would you open? 
at six o'clock in the morning when your pollinators are more active exactly. in the late afternoon or exactly. evening. Yeah. So we we predicted it open somewhere around four thirty or five o'clock in the morning. Nice. Started opening and then yeah. it takes about five hours for it to open. Yeah. Well, also, you know, one more note to say about this is that sometimes it's it's really challenging to get any of these plants to bloom. You know. If, even if you have a house plant, sometimes it's challenging to get a bloom, right? Well, so even, or even to find one in bloom, like I just yeah. happen to walk by and this is one I need to put away. This but this is an anthurium that, and it's a kind of lovely spathe and spathe. Yeah. It's white instead of the boring green. <laughs> yeah, very creamy. <laughs> yeah, so I, you just, sometimes you, there's just so many plants in here, you just don't get to see all of them. This one's actually a nice one. It reminds me of the andreanum, mm -hmm. like kind of leaf, but really beautiful, creamy spathe and spadex. I doubt that it blooms nearly as much as, yeah. as that one. Yeah. But. And then the, this guy here, okay, so. This is a small one. This one actually only gets to be up to eight inches tall. It's kind of unusual because it will continue to bloom the leaves will go dormant, mm -hmm. and then it'll shoot up another leaf. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much kind of unusual for, for a morphophallus. Usually there's a longer dormancy. You can force it into dormancy. By, you can force them into dormancy. Well, this particular one you can, for okay. sure. I, I don't tend to try to force them into, into um, dormancy. How would you do that? Just by taking away the water? Mm -hmm. or Okay. So this is just quit watering it, and it, it, and it should, should go go dormant mm -hmm. and then a few months later it'll start sprouting again mm -hmm. and this this again is also a little unusual because it will also bloom as it is as it is leafed out so hmm. most more a lot of more morphophallus don't again there's 200 over 200 different species of amorphophallus yeah and I, like when i started back in the early 2000s here there was, there's been at least another 30 that have been come into the fold that we know of. I'm wondering if other small ones, you said this one actually flowers when it has the leaves out. You know, and I'm thinking about the Amorphophallus titanum, you know, to have the leaf and the flower seems like a lot of energy. Like they almost would probably need, maybe not double the energy, but a lot. This one's a little tinier. You would imagine that it has maybe enough energy. So I'm wondering if the other small ones, do, do they have a tendency to leaf out? Well, and the one at the that same I time? have the most experience with that's in another greenhouse, mm -hmm. um, Polyanum, mm -hmm. uh, it totally loses all its leaves. But it, like, from November through February, it sends up this little bitty bloom and it's you can barely see it because it's pretty much camouflaged by when you're looking at the soil it kind of blends in uh, and it just continue it's like but also if you looked at the plant it's it, it's it's probably full of tubers too yeah. so it's probably it just each tuber setting up one flower but it, and but there's no leaves and then it goes dormant and you know at the end of February March and then it throws up all its leaves again. Yeah, so it's it's they not there are some that will bloom together, but most of them don't. And this is not the smallest of the amorphophallus. No. Okay. There is a smaller one, but they're very similar. Yeah. And that they come from the I think the same area. Nice. And um, but this is just one of so just to compare this mm -hmm. one, this leaf here is three inches tall mm -hmm. compared to not uh, eight foot. Yeah. So. And most of those come in the, from the Asian countries, mm -hmm. and so you don't usually find these. What you find more in North America are your aracemas yeah. and your arums. And Do you have skunk cabbage around here? That's in the uh, Climatron. Okay, because skunk cabbage is uh, is also a you know, mm -hmm. in a roid, and it gets really hot, right? And right. it sometimes will melt the snow around it. Right. So right. I want, I'm assuming that some of these would actually do that too if they're well, I mean, hardy you, enough. Like the Titan, and yeah. that heats up as it's as it's um, opening. Have you ever put like a, one of those heat meters, like the, what you have, like those? We took a, we actually one time borrowed an infrared camera. Yeah. 
and the infrared and the infrared camera you told us what temperatures everything was. Yeah. So that that way we did see that. And and they do heat up to not quite 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit over body you know, our body heat. Mm -hmm. So I want to say the one that we did was about 99 something. Okay. And if you enjoy field trips like this, be sure to let us know in the comments below. And if you're coming back to these videos on a regular basis and you haven't yet subscribed, consider supporting the channel that way as it gives us more opportunities to create long form botanical content of plants and the people who love them. In the meantime, you could check out our online houseplant courses and offerings like the 125 Houseplant Care Spreadsheet, Troubleshoot Your Houseplants, Houseplant Basics, and the Houseplant Masterclass. Learn more over at homesteadbrooklyn.com.